everyone and welcome. I'm Achilleas Kostoulas from the ELT Research and Methodology section of the Department of English Studies at the University of Graz. And it gives me great pleasure to be to launch this series of webinars uh, in, with the help of uh, the Arts and Humanities Center for Teaching and Learning. In today's webinar, we are honored to host Dr. Jupp Stelma from the Manchester Manchester Institute of uh, Education um, at the University of Manchester in the UK. Dr. Stelma is the program director of the MA course for teaching English to speakers of other languages. And you, you told me to give this short, so I am. You, uh, Dr. Stelma is here to talk to us today about classroom-based research, research that is conducted by language teachers in their own classrooms with the aim of developing their professional practice and developing as teachers. So we are very honored to have you with us today, Yup. So over to you. Thank you. Again, yeah, I work at the University of Manchester and we have a sunny day for a change. Look, doesn't happen very often in Manchester. We have a lot of rain, drizzling rain. Um, I teach on MA TESOL, which has a lot of English language teachers primarily from different parts of the world. Uh, we have some Brits, we have quite a few East Asians, uh, China, Korea, Japan. We have uh, Africa, Africa, Middle East, South America. Um, we don't have too many European students, and looking at the names, I'm suspecting that we have mainly Europeans here. Can I can I ask you where where you're from? So if you said um, something like this, I'm going to type in a message here. Uh, I'm from Manchester, but I am actually Norwegian. Uh, I work at the University of Manchester. Could you type in something similar, everyone? That'd be nice, as an introduction. So Cornell is from Hungary, currently studying in Spain. Um, Sylvia is typing, other people are typing, that's great. And the reason I want to know is because it's just nice to know who, who we're talking with. And also, I'm with such a small group, I'm very happy for people to type things in uh, in the common conversation field on the left, and I'll keep an eye on that. So we have Achilleses from Greece, currently working in Austria. Uh, you guys keep on typing, okay? Um, Katerina is from Graz. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is language teachers, or teachers generally actually, uh, doing research. And the first thing that's a bit controversial is the word research. Uh, you might argue that research is, is something that academics or scientists do, but we are language users. We can use the words we want. And uh, I'm very happy to use research for what teachers might be doing as well. Uh, I'm going to start flicking through uh, and I'm going to talk about what meaningful language teacher research might be. Ah, we have Sylvia from Graz, Austria as well, working in an upper secondary school. Uh, nice. And uh, Caroline is from uh, Austria, also in Graz. Uh, okay. Um, now, as, as a language teacher, um, you are constantly developing as a professional. And uh, as you are teaching, you are noticing that things go well, other things go less well, and there are all these puzzles that might appear in your mind about why this goes well, why that goes less well. And uh, it's these puzzles or these challenges or these problems or these little opportunities that you perceive that we call, or I call, uh, meaningful language teacher research, if you focus on those. 
Now, if you do research, I think you should be uh, purposeful uh, in the sense that you try to enhance, change, improve, make better something that you value. Either the learning of your students, your teaching, your professional development, your happiness, or your understanding, or your students' understanding, or your students' happiness. Something that is purposeful to you. And because we're using the word research, I think we are talking about a systematic and rigorous uh, process, but not overly rigorous, not overly systematic. So a systematicity that is, seems appropriate given the purpose or the problem or the puzzle that you are inquiring. Um, now, as a teacher, and you, uh, you get up in the morning, you worry about your classes, you go to school, uh, you are teaching several classes every day, you have to prepare for these classes, you have homework to check, you have assignments to set, you have assignments to mark, you have teachers' meetings to go to, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we add research, uh, that might be difficult because it requires time. Also, um, the word research uh, seems to be associated with uh, the toolkits, the knowledge of university scientists, academic research. And, and that might be uh, a challenge as well. And finally, research is commonly associated with making a, a, a contribution. And here I see a second spelling mistake in my presentation. I'm very sorry, generalizable. Um, However, I'm flicking to the next slide here, does this apply to teacher research? Not quite, I think. Um, the reality of teacher research is yes, it requires additional time, but how much will depend on how rigorous you need to be. Remember, how rigorous you need to be depends on what you're trying to achieve. Expertise is required, but the kind of tools that academic researchers use uh, all the statistical analyses and the uh, uh, lengthy uh, consideration of research methodology may be of limited use. Uh, and also the contribution doesn't have to be to the world, it could be to your classroom, uh, your school, your learners, your community. Um, and finally support, yes you do need um, your head, your principal, your colleagues, and your students support uh, and uh, to, to do this because it does take you a little bit beyond the, the normal teaching activity. So we have Hydrin is working at the grammar school uh, and at the university. Hi Hydrin. So you can hear us now, yes, that's good. Um, now let's have a closer look at, at teacher research. I'm going to divide it into these three types of headings, what, why, and how. And I'm going to start with the what and the why. Um, so the what, and I've already indicated this, is a challenge, a problem, a puzzle, an opportunity that you've identified in your professional life. And the why, I've also identified this, this need for purpose, and an, an intention to enhance something that you value, learning, teaching, development, well-being, understanding, etc. Now, I'm going to give you some examples. These examples are from uh, students that we have had do our masters in Manchester. And you'll see that there are a variety of international contexts that are being referred to. Um, the first one, uh, if you just take a second to look through that one. Let me see if I can do something. Yes. So this is someone who wants to investigate how middle school students, so that would be similar to the, in age of, to the secondary school students, which uh, Sylvia may be teaching, um, at an international school acquire art-related vocabulary and, it apply, and apply it to their discussions about art. So art-related vocabulary. I want to investigate this topic because I am currently teaching art to middle school students at an international school. 
And I have noticed that while my students seem to acquire art-related vocabulary and apply it in structured situations, they often do not use this vocabulary when discussing art outside of these focus sessions. So this is a very typical problem in language learning, that you acquire the vocabulary, you put it away in your mind somewhere, and you can kind of reproduce the vocabulary in classroom situations. But when you're asked to spontaneously use it in other situations, you cannot. And, and this person wants to understand that better. So it's a puzzle to this student, to, to this uh, teacher. Another example. Um, I'm interested in exploring how and why students use L1 when completing tasks in groups in my oral English classes. And this person works in a high school in Japan. Uh, well, actually, so these are the age of Sylvia's students uh, because Sylvia teaches upper middle, uh, upper secondary. So um, this teacher is constantly battling to get the kids to speak English. Uh, but he has begun to consider that the students speaking Japanese may not actually be quite the negative thing he once thought. So he wants to explore how different types of tasks affect the language produced, whether it's Japanese or English, and whether the teacher actually has any influence over this uh, language choice. So again, a topic very closely linked to the teacher's everyday practice. And now I'm starting to feel a bit lonely here because I'm not getting any feedback from the screen. This is a, the, the strangeness of doing a webinar. Uh, I'll keep going, don't worry. But if you want to type in little messages on the left in the conversation, I'm very happy to occasionally glance uh, and, and, and see comments from you. But, but there are no expectations, don't worry. Uh, another example of a puzzle, something that a teacher uh, on our MA uh, looked into as a researcher. How does language used by the learner in the teen grid of second life differ from language used in the classroom? So this, this, this person, this teacher is interested in the online language learning, second life, which is not quite as popular as it was six, seven years ago, but people still use it. Um, and his language school is piloting a particular uh, context within Second Life uh, with teen learners, and he wants to research that. So again, closely tied to his professional experience. Uh, a final example, what strategies, if any, do Arab learners use in reading IELTS texts? And then uh, the, the, the person uh, explains why that is interesting to them. Notice the hunch in the second pa last paragraph. Um, they probably lack good reading skills. The hunches will shape your, your, your research activity. Um, okay, Sylvia, I think there's probably a delay in this flicking of the, of, the, of the slides. So I'll probably, yeah, there's not much I can do, to, to, do about that. Yes, Sylvia, you can move, you can yourself click through and, and uh, do it yourself when you hear that I'm talking about the next example. Okay, so now I'm going to the how. So this is my slide 10. Um, it might have been my mistake, actually. Okay, um, Achilles, I have a problem. Don't worry, Louis. Uh, whenever I start clicking through my slides, it returns to a private view, uh, Achilles. Uh, I think that the best way to approach this is that if, to avoid the delay as well, people can just click on the two little arrows underneath the slides. So there's this. Underneath the slide, it should say slide 8 of 24, and people can just click on those and move forward. Okay, so I'll be very explicit about which slide I'm on. I'm on slide 10 now, okay? Okay. Uh, Sylvia says there are no arrows there. Um, okay, let's see if we can... There are little that. arrows at the bottom of the... Uh, Okay, 
So I'm on slide. I'm on slide ten now. So okay. how do we go about doing teacher research? So we have these puzzles that we want to research in our professional context. Um, the being in teacher research it goes beyond the normal everyday teaching or planning to teach. Um, the exploration again will be systematic and detailed, but no, not more so than what the issue, problem, puzzle, or purpose calls for. And I'm going to talk about three ways of thinking about teacher research. There's action research, exploratory practice, and lesson study. And these are in no particular order. Okay, now I'm looking at the visual on, pay, on slide 11. Okay. Uh, are you? Uh, I, I hope you're all seeing this. This is the uh, uh, three bubbles. There's lesson study, there's action research, and there's exploratory practice. Now you'll see I have uh, a, a horizontal dimension which goes from reflecting on practice to reflecting in practice, and you have a vertical uh, dimension which goes from technical rationality to interpretive understanding. Uh, can I ask you, how many of you are familiar with the distinction between reflecting on practice and reflecting in practice? So if you, if you know about this, just type in yes. And if you are unsure about this, type in no. Aha, we have one yes, another yes. Another question mark, that's fine. Um, so, the reflecting on practice is, the idea is that you, um, you are not in the activity anymore, you step away from the activity, you take a calm moment, you look at what you did from outside, and you're reflecting on it, you're thinking about it. Uh, reflecting in practice is whilst you're doing the activity, whilst you're teaching, something might happen, and on the fly, whilst you're teaching, without stopping, one part of your mind is going, ah, ooh, what should I do? And you make a quick decision, and you go on. That's reflecting in practice. That's the distinction. And the distinction is from uh, an American researcher called Donald Schoen, which you might have heard of. Donald Schoen also is responsible for that dimension, which is up here there's technical rationality, and that's the idea that everything can be worked out in detail, uh, and that you can kind of specify what are the elements that need to be attended to, and how things work. And if you imagine a car engine, you could work out, you could write down exactly how a car engine works. But a classroom is full of human beings, and human beings are unpredictable. Uh, we are not machines, we're not computers, and sometimes we have to use intuition. Uh, there are emotions at play, and therefore we very often have to rely on interpretive understanding. So that is that dimension, up and down. Now, let's then move on to action research first, I think, which seems to span all these dimensions. Oops. Um, action research is an approach to teacher research that is focused on enhancing practice, maybe perceived as a self-intervention in the teacher's professional activity, so you intervene in your own activity. Uh, and may involve data generation, analysis, and then may draw on that traditional toolkit of the academic world. Um, now, action research is a cycle. So where you start is really not important. You could start with, with planning, which is right there, and then you go over to uh, acting, and then you're observing, and then you're reflecting, and then you go around that way. Uh, or you can start with reflecting, then planning, then acting, observing, or you start with observing. But the idea is that you plan, 
something uh, for your teaching for next week's classes. You uh, act, you try it out, and you observe yourself, you observe what's happening in the classroom, you observe what the students are doing. Then afterwards, you reflect on it. Um, notice this reflecting is reflecting on. Reflecting on. This is I'm on, on slide 13 now. Uh, it's not reflecting in. And then you might realize that something went wrong, you change your plan, and then you act again. And when you do that, you, you get this cycle going like this. And the idea is that as you do this, you gradually change and things get better. You become more polished uh, and I'm now on slide still slide 13 um, did the spiral appear for you I hope it did if I return to presenters for you now maybe the, now it appears okay now action research thank you Cornell it's there good uh, action research how now I'm on slide 14 uh, there are many different interpretations of action research. Action research has been around uh, since well, at least 50 years, probably longer. Um, and there are people who talk about it uh, more instrumentally, more as a technical rationality, and for people who talk about it as a more human thing to do. And you can see very quickly in these different definitions I'm going to show you how different authors emphasize different aspects of action research. So here, uh, this off, these authors, Karen Chemis, they uh, talk about it as self-reflective, and they also talk about rationality and justice and understanding. So it's a bit of a mixed definition. Uh, we have another definition here, which has words like uh, systematic, data, analyzing, decisions. And this is Wallace, 1998. He's, he's writing about action research for language teachers. So if you pick up Wallace, you can expect a more technical discussion of action research as compared to car and chemists. Uh, so action research is actually different things to different people. They all have the, the cycle, but the way you go through the cycle can be either more technical or more intuitive. Okay, I'm going to move on to the second type of teacher research that I want to talk about, and that's exploratory practice. And this is a less famous, uh, if you like, uh, form of teacher research. I'm now on slide 15. Uh, this is an approach to teacher research that is focused on teachers' or learners' own puzzles. Um, it, and that's, that's similar to action research. It aims to develop understanding and well-being. Now notice this well-being, this quality of life thing. That's, that's its aim. So it's not necessarily trying to increase the amount of learning or getting through the curriculum faster. It's about making people in the classroom, teacher and the learners, happier, uh, more content, uh, more fulfilled. So it's a, it's a it's more humanistic perspective. Um, and what you do, it adjusts to the teacher's own professional activities. So you don't use the toolkit of academic research. Uh, there are some principles of exploratory practice, and you can see the hum, human, humanistic uh, perspective in these principles. So you have, now I'm on slide 16. 16, yes. So you have quality of life, understanding, everybody, so that's that, that sense of sharing, together, mutual, continuous, and minimizing the burden uh, by integrating the work of understanding into normal pedagogic practice. So whilst if you're doing action research, you might um, have a separate observation instrument or a questionnaire that your learners do to figure out whether something works or not. It's a, a additional to the normal teaching and learning. But for exploratory practice, you try to do activities which are actually your normal teaching and learning, but at the same time generate data. 
So you might have your learners write about their English language learning, and that becomes your data. Uh, there are steps associated with exploratory practice. Uh, identify a puzzle area, refine your thinking, select a specific topic, find appropriate classroom procedures, adapt them to the particular puzzle you want to explore. Um, so you might uh, substitute discussion of the chosen puzzle. So if if you um, if you have a discussion class and you discuss pollution or holidays, you might change that to discussing learning or teaching. Uh, you use these in class and then you reflect on those, step seven, and then you may make a new plan, step eight. So it has a similar flavor to action research, but the important bit is step four and five. You do, you do not have extra data collection, you use the data generated by a normal class uh, instead. Now I'm going, that was slide 17. Thank you, Achilles, for, for telling everyone where I am, because I'm forgetting to tell people. Um, so let me give you some examples of puzzles and how to explore those. Uh, you might have a teacher's puzzle. Why do students never listen to me? And I'm sure most teachers will have experienced this. Why do students not listen to me? So you might observe student listening behavior during normal classroom activities where listening is expected. Or you might adapt a discussion activity to have learners overtly reflect on how they listen. So you might ask the learners to talk about how they listen in class and then make a poster where they talk about their listening, and then that can be displayed in the classroom. So you're actually researching an aspect of what's happening in the classroom without giving people a, a questionnaire or something research-like. You, you're just doing some normal teaching and learning activities. You might have a learner uh, which asks, uh, a learner might say to themselves, why don't I speak with others in the class? So the learner might be shy. Uh, and then you can, again, you can take a discussion activity and have the learners talk about who they speak to and why in class. And that's quite interesting because then you get people starting to think about the social dynamics of the classroom and, 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 and how they might be able to learn from each other. That was slide 18. And 19, no, 18, still in 18. So th these why questions, so these uh, examples are from uh, a colleague here at Manchester. Her name is Susan Dawson. Uh, the suggestions uh, are my own. So um, I want to talk now about a third way of doing teacher research. Uh, so now I'm slide 19. And that's called lesson study. Um, lesson study is something that originates in Japan, uh, where it's used within schools, uh, it's used between schools, and sometimes even nationally. Um, so in a school, a group of teachers may wish to develop uh, some kind of theme, let's say nature or uh, science, uh, and it may proceed as follows. And I'm clicking through slide 19 here now. Um, so the group may agree a pedagogical goal. Uh, so that would be about the theme then, say science or nature or uh, history, uh, some particular f part of history. Uh, they plan a lesson together. So this group of teachers might sit together and plan a lesson, like how do we teach this to our students? Uh, it might simply be a single lesson. Uh, or a series of lessons, then one of the teachers will teach the research lesson or the lesson, and the others will be in the classroom observing. Then afterwards, the group meets to share their observations of this research lesson. 
And, and in that discussion, they may decide to change the lesson a bit. Uh, possibly moving on to a next uh, theme or ch teaching the same lesson it, with a new group of students. But this time, another teacher may do the lesson uh, so that the burden is shared uh, across the group. And then the others again will sit in and, and uh, observe. And this goes on then, where you have this sharing of practice, you do this planning together, you observe each other, you get back together and you reflect. And that's a very uh, a different model um, than action research and exploratory practice. Um, lesson study can be used, and now I'm slide 20. Yes, 20. Um, you may, you can imagine that lesson study could be used for in-service professional development. So you might have a, a mixture of more experienced and less experienced teachers working together in a lesson study group. Uh, you could also imagine a lesson study group inviting an outside person or how a, a teacher from another school might join a group. Um, and in, in the way it's used in Japan, often a lesson study group, uh, after having worked together for a while on a particular theme, might uh, write a lesson study report. And that might then become part of the uh, collective wisdom of the school, if you like. Um, I'm still on slide 20 here. Um, it is, do you remember the, uh, the, the, the visual? I'll, I'll, I'll put it back up. I, I think I have it here. I'm quickly going to go to slide. Yeah, no, that didn't work. Okay. I'm still on slide 20. Not, not to worry. Uh, lesson study does feel more like research because you have uh, this explicit planning of a lesson, you have carrying out of the lesson, people observing, then comparing their observations, and then moving on. And uh, so it's, it's, it's more that sense of technical rationality. Now I'm on to slide 21. Um, 21. Uh, slide 21. Uh, you may, if you start reading about lesson studies, see um, reference to instructional rounds. And that's what uh, lesson study has become uh, in America. They call it instructional rounds. And you can see how, how instructional rounds uh, kind of uh, captures that quality that you, you go, you, 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 uh, you have this group and, and, and you do, uh, you, this person gives some instruction and this one and this one and this one. So you can kind of see that's instructional rounds. Uh, and, and that would be a small group of teachers wishing to learn from each other. Uh, a group observes one teacher's class. It might not in the American tradition be a research lesson. It might be any class. Uh, others observe uh, and then they reflect on, on the experience together. So it's, there's less of a sense of this developing a theme, that's, that's the sense of this, we have to collectively do something together. It's more a sense of learning from each other. But it has some of the qualities of lesson study. Um, and, 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 but it's an American reinterpretation, if you like. Okay, I want to move on to slide 22. Slide 22. Bye, Sylvia. Um, and looking again at the, at the visual of uh, lesson study, action research, and exploratory practice. And again, we can see lesson study is in the top left triangle, where you are stepping away and reflecting on your practice, and there is more technical rationality involved. And you can see exploratory practice is at the bottom where there is a more focus on interpretive understanding 
and the reflecting can be either in practice or on practice, but it's a more humanistic perspective. And then finally, action research, depending on who you read, it might be more technical rationality or more interpretive understanding and reflecting in practice. Now, I'm on slide 23, and I think that's my nearly my final slide. So, if we imagine the potential benefits of teachers doing research, uh, well, presumably, by doing this activity, uh, your practice as a teacher will improve. Um, you. Uh, it's a process of professional development. Uh, it aids and strengthens your own reflective practice. Uh, you might gain more uh, of a sense of professionalism. Uh, you will feel more plausible as a teacher. You, you, you actually do something more than simply going in every day, teaching a lesson, going home. Um, within and externally to your school, you might become more recognized for what you're doing and you might take what you're learning to practitioner conferences and hopefully it will improve the quality of your life uh, and your learner's life and and that's where doing teacher research might increase both yours and your learner's motivation and that's the end of the talk thank you very much and thank you for being with us uh... Now, I don't know if there are any questions from uh, the other participants, but I think I'd like to start with one, if I may. Many people might uh, argue that uh, well, teachers have quite a heavy workload already, yeah. and that adding the demand for doing research as part of their professional practice might be just a little bit too much. And I was wondering if you have any comments on that. Absolutely. Um, doing research alongside doing teaching, if you see research as a completely separate activity from teaching, it will be too much. But if you see research as part of teaching, as part of what you're doing, and you can bring research and teaching together, if you like, it's, and, and exploratory practice is the model that does that most explicitly, I think it can become more manageable. Mm -hmm. Because you have additional benefits as well. If you have your learners doing communication tasks anyway, such as discussing climate change, or discussing um, computer games or fashion, and you do this because they think it's that you think your learners would enjoy discussing fashion or computer games or climate change. Why not have them discuss their own language learning? Because surely that is interesting to them as well. Uh, and then what you are then doing is you are getting them to engage with their, their purposes for being in the classroom. And it might focus on how they listen or how they speak to others. It might focus on how they learn vocabulary. It might focus on how they find grammar to be challenging and difficult. And the sense of sharing about their own experience as language learners might be very engaging to your learners. And they can do that in English or in whatever target language you're teaching. Mm -hmm. Just as well as they can use English to discuss climate change or fashion or computer games. Mm -hmm. And you're not actually adding any workload to anyone, but you're doing research. And in this case, the learners are actually researching their own learning activity mm -hmm. and you are learning from them mm -hmm. what uh, their experience is 
And if in addition then, at the end of such a group communicative task, you have them produce little posters, which they can share with other groups by posting them on the wall, uh, you can see further speaking activities uh, emerging from that, uh, and, and you actually get things that you can take with you mm -hmm. after class and sit and look at and go, hmm, so this is what it is to be a learner. I'm going to change my class tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You're not actually doing any extra work. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a bit of extra sort of changing your mindset to, 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 to organize your teaching differently. But this is seeing research and teaching very much as the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, I, okay, some more questions? I think we have some questions. In yes, the, uh, so let's... Shall we discuss mm -hmm. Cornell's yes. questions? Yes, shall two we? questions. So would you like to, would you like me to read it out or? I can read them out, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, Cornell's first question is, do these three types of teacher research belong to what we call reflective practice or reflective teaching? Um, I would say yes and yes. Hmm. But like so many things in life, uh, if you are, um, if you use the word reflection, you see the teaching and learning, uh, you, you see education in a certain light. If you use the word research, you see it from a slightly different perspective. But teacher research and reflection are certainly very, very closely connected activities. I don't think you can be a teacher researcher without being a reflective practitioner. Mm -hmm. And if you are a reflective practitioner, I think very often you are also a teacher researcher. Mm -hmm. If anything, the more explicit teacher research models, such as action research and lesson study, they are a little bit more systematic, a little bit more um, time consuming than uh, the normal day-to-day -day reflective practice that you might engage with. With the exploratory practice, it's a little bit in between. So, so certainly these, these, these models of research, they, they do add something additional, something more systematic to your reflective practice, but they all include reflective practice. So there's a very overlapping relationship between being a teacher researcher and a reflective practitioner. So that makes sense. And how about Cornell's second question? Uh, do you think that these types of uh, research or similar types of research should be introduced into teacher training in some form? I, I believe that uh, reflective practice is, is very much part of teacher training in many parts of the world. Um, action research is occasionally featuring in, in, in partial teacher training. It, it, it is clearly the, the dominant form of teacher research when you look at the literature. Mm -hmm. um, I think action research can be a little bit off-putting because it does feel like you have to do a lot of extra work. Mm -hmm. uh, I think exploratory practice would be a, a very promising something to add to teacher training because it brings research and teaching more closely together and it's more sustainable for a teacher to engage in. Mm -hmm. So that would be my view. Great, thank you. We... I don't know if there are any more questions forthcoming. So we... So, um... I, if there are no more questions, I have one. The, f the first question I asked you sort of challenged you from a teacher's perspective. Yeah. So is this more work? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and challenge you from a researcher's quote-unquote perspective. Okay. So if somebody were to argue that all these are fine forms of structured reflection, but they are not really a research, in the strict sense of the word. How would you respond? I, I would ask you, what is the strict sense of the word? 
statistics. Okay. Well, that's your strict sense of the word. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think my strict sense of the word is? Shall we go to what a definition of what is a definition of research then? I think basically that's that's what the question is about. I think it's a good question. It's a good so question. Shall we take uh, a definition like the one provided by David Nolan, maybe? So if we view research as a systematic process of inquiry yeah. into a social phenomenon, would we would we argue that this kind of research is maybe not rigorous enough? Or? I think that what I was saying is that uh, it is systematic. These mm -hmm. models of teacher research do provide a systematic step-by-step, -step, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, method to, mm -hmm. to, to, to generate understanding. Mm -hmm. So I would say, certainly on that criteria, which you just cited from David Noonan, I think that these, uh, these activities that I've suggested are research. Now, I suspect, though, that David Noonan has some additional criteria, and uh, such as data collection, mm -hmm. uh, possibly something having to do with a research question, which has to be formalized. Uh, and, or a uh, puzzle, perhaps, more recently. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry? Or a puzzle, if not necessarily a strict, formally defined research question. In which case that David Noonan has softened up his definition of research over the years. Mm -hmm. um, so, with a more scientific definition of research, such as you have to have some kind of hypothesis uh, that generates maybe a research question, and then you generate data or you collect data to, to uh, respond to the research question, and then you analyze that data, certainly on that kind of strict understanding of research, these models of teacher research do not qualify. But? But if you soften up that definition a little bit, and the systematicity and the rigor of, of the teacher research that you do is uh, in proportion to what you're trying to achieve, as a teacher, mm -hmm. you're primarily a teacher, mm -hmm. uh, then I think that a definition that you first suggested, mm -hmm. research as a systematic process, inquiry, process of inquiry, I think that these, these uh, models of teacher research do qualify. Mm -hmm. That would be my view. So then to put these two things together, one might argue that Practitioner research, classroom-based research, is in some ways in an awkward position between pure practice and research, but at the same time it blends positive qualities of both, and it does so with a view to making a difference in our professional lives and in the learning outcomes of our students. So that's what makes it worthwhile. Is that what you're arguing? I, I think uh, I think that's a really nice summary. Uh, there is so much um, in life and in academia and in uh, society today uh, which is interdisciplinary, mm -hmm. which is different traditions trying to come together. And when you merge two different activities, two different traditions, you get something more. Mm -hmm. something new. Uh, at the same time, you have people who are very proud of their more singular tradition. So in universities, we have historians who only speak to other historians. You have geographers who only speak to other geographers, physicists who only speak to other physicists. But then, when two disciplines meet, interesting things happen. You have interdisciplinarity. So when you take teachers talking to researchers and actually engaging with each other and trying to find models that teachers, where teachers can do research or where researchers can teach, that's where interesting things happen. So yes, absolutely, 
this is this is fruitful territory. New things can happen in this new space. Right. I think I think that was very well, very nicely put. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if there are any more questions from our participants, but uh, if there are not, then I'd like to thank you very much for. Yeah, we have we have one person typing, so let's oh, see what, what comes. See if Cornell can squeeze out another question. Ah, oh, so thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for participating. Yeah. So, once again, you thank you for uh, sharing your time and knowledge and expertise on this. I think I speaking on behalf of everyone, saying in saying that it was really useful and uh, interesting and. Uh, what I'd like to, well, actually, I'd like to just do some advertising. Uh, yeah. We are going to hold another uh, webinar, which is perhaps more, um, it's going to be on uh, the use of YouTube in uh, language education. And it's going to take place on the 10th of uh, June. So there will be an announcement. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you all there as well. So thanks again your time you and thank you everybody and thank you to uh to all the audience katrina anita elizabeth uh i'm reading names here caroline uh cornell and lewis mm -hmm. yeah so and thank you to you thank you for organizing this thank you all.